So welcome everyone to Strategies for Enhancing Instructor Presence in your online classroom. And I thought today uh, we could just start a little bit with our goals and getting to know each other, and then we can get into all of the different content. So um, we do have a couple of goals for you for today. So hopefully I can give you some new ideas for how to communicate effectively with your online students. Um, how to show your students that you are present, as well as how you can support them for their overall success. And I'm going to give you a couple of opportunities just to interact and get to know each other. So if you wouldn't mind um, in the text chat, if you can introduce yourself, your name, what is it that you teach, and um, in your mind, what makes a strong, positive teacher impression? And I'm just going to wait a moment and I'll let you type. Hello, Helena. Welcome. You joined us just in time. Um, I think everyone's just kind of typing in the chat. We're doing a little bit of uh, icebreakers to get us started. So um, if you can find that purple thumbprint at the bottom of your screen, if you expand that panel, um, you should see a text chat that you can type in. Megan, would you tell us um, again what it is you want us to act, to answer in the in our little introduction? Yeah, you can just um, well, your name will come up automatically, but you can include what it is that you teach and uh, what you believe makes a strong, positive teacher impression. Okay, thank you. Great, I see them all piling in. So Lori is from the ETRA department, and that's actually my my doctorate program. So I'm very fond of ETRA. Um, let's see, she thinks that students in online classes really want to feel like their instructor is present. And she does this by providing consistent communications via announcements and Blackboard messages and providing prompt feedback on assignments. Fantastic. Kelly teaches in higher education and student affairs program and enthusiasm makes a world of difference. It really does. I love when I get an instructor who is just passionate about their field and about their course. Yes, it makes me want to be there. Helena is teaching public speaking in the comms department for, for 25 years. Congratulations, it's fantastic. And Helena, what do you think makes a, a positive teacher impression? Or if you prefer the microphone, if that's easier, you can come on the mic as well. Hi, can you hear me? I sure can. 
uh, I'm kind of a slow typer, but uh, so I was working on it while you were asking, and I. Um, but I think empathy is a huge part. You know, letting students know that you were an undergrad at one time, and you remember how crazy the first week of class is, and um, I think that's important um, early on. But I also think the other things that people, uh, every that the others have mentioned. Um, you know, uh, enthusiasm, uh, getting their uh, feedback to them on assignments very quickly, and then just being available for uh, to interact with you. You're going to steal all the, all the content for the, the workshop. No, I'm just kidding. Right. But yes, I agree. <laughs> I 100% agree. All right, so we'll move on. Thank you, everyone. So here's another um, approach that we can take when we're thinking about instructor presence in an online course, is to think about how online teaching is different. Right? I, I think many of us or most of us may have come to teaching from the face-to-face -face traditional classroom. Um, so you know you can think of one or two of these, but you know, how do you approach communicating effectively with your students? And how do you show them that you're present? or how do you support their success? And I know you may have already touched on this, so if you've already answered it, you know. But it, it is kind of a nice way to think about how are online students different? And I'll take either text answers if you're more comfortable typing or if you prefer the microphone, the floor is yours. Uh, one of the things that I started doing this summer was um, when I'm communicating feedback to my students, uh, one of the platforms that we use is McGraw-Hill Connect. I, I actually uh, have the option to give my feedback as an audio recording rather than as, you know, a little blurb, uh, text blurb. And so I think that makes a huge difference because then they can hear in my voice uh, that I'm excited about how they did. And I think there's less possibility for miscommunication when you're communicating verbally rather than in text. I think it's easy to for people to misread uh, text. And then, um, and then I've also just found, and I just did it for the first time yesterday, when you do an announcement in Blackboard, if you click on the little plus sign, there's a little box that says media, and you can actually record part of your announcement uh, with audio. <laughs> so I used that for the first time yesterday, but I, I think those two things help. I love this. Yes, I love that the voice inflection can really just change or enhance the classroom. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it makes all the difference. And then I've also started, and I actually got this from a professor in the Etcher department, Fabio Collada. I started responding um, when I closed my emails and my announcements, my closing word that I use instead of best regards or whatever. Uh, Fossil always used the word kindly, kindly comma, and then he'd sign his name. And so I started doing that as well. And I think that makes a difference. I love that. I think I had a colleague who always used uh, warm wishes. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's wonderful. That, that's a good one. That's a good one, too. All right. And then I see Lori has been typing in the text chat here. And Lori offers online office hours twice each week and collaborate to offer assignment help and support. I make sure students know when my office hours are. And I encourage them to drop in any time to connect live with me. That's fantastic. You're on top of it. All of you are. And Kelly goes over assignment expectations well in advance and use class time for students to brainstorm about projects or to do group work. Love that. Yes. Making the most of your synchronous course time together. So um, it's not just you know, lecture based. It's a great, great way to get them involved. Megan, do you mind if I make a quick comment or ask a question? Sure, please. So I teach undergrad gen ed courses, and it's typically one of several sections um, offered, right? 
So we, uh, I'm a teaching assistant. And so we all have our Blackboard course shells populated for us. I'm pretty sort of stuck in, you know, what is already present in the course. But there isn't a whole lot of student interaction opportunities built into the courses that I teach. So I'm really looking for ways to make my presence more enhanced. You know, what can I do with the content that I'm given, which I can't really augment much? What can, you know, what kinds of things can I do to make myself more present? Like I, I'm not currently using lots of videos and I think um, Helena mentioned um, videos. So, you know, what kinds of things like videos and things like that can I do to enhance my presence? That's sort of what I'm looking for. Great. I think we're going to have some things for you today. So part of that is you're going to want to think about when and how you expect your students to communicate. For instance, do you're going to want to start thinking to yourself, do we have synchronous time together or is it asynchronous? Um, and so you're going to want to think of formats like that and how and when can students uh, log into their course and when can they respond. So that's going to be the, the first step. The other part is when you think about instructor presence, um, as you touched on, it also means students getting together and working together, right? It's not just students getting to know you, but um, they're getting to know each other through you because you are the facilitator. So I think you're going to want to start to think about activities that you can do, icebreakers, uh, and that doesn't even have to get down to trying to alter or change your course content, which as you said, may already be pre-prescribed. Um, so there's you know, additional ways that um, you can use that valuable course time, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous um, for your students to, to connect. So I do have some specific ideas for you, and I want to come back to this in a little bit and, and see if uh, we've started generating some, some ideas. But um, those are all the different things that I would tell, encourage you to think about now is how do you envision your students you know, entering your course? Um, what times um, are they together? Are they oftentimes um, doing this on their own. If it's an asynchronous course, it may feel a little bit more solitary. Um, so if you can kind of establish those patterns first, then you might think of some specific activities that you can insert into your course to, to work for your specific student population. And I see the chat is going wild here, so I have to pop in really quick. Um, Lena says, I've started using the phrase student drop-in hours rather than office hours to make it feel less intimidating. Oh, that's a nice one. Um, and you've made an introduction video on your phone and included your pets. Yes, yes, all of these things are, are excellent ideas here. All right, so let's see if we can add to, to this list that you're already generating. All right, so I suppose I should go back a slide and say, well, what is instructor presence? I, we should probably define this just for ourselves today um, so that we can expand on this idea. So before we can discuss those strategies for enhancing our instructor presence, we, we do want to define it. And simply put, I think instructor presence means being there or being present for your class. It means that your students see you as an accessible real person who is there to help them with their learning. So um, when they get into their online course, they, they truly know who you are. You're not just um, a staff photo or a bobblehead. They, they think that they actually could identify you. So in other words, instructor presence is about creating this perception for your students that you are this real person right there with them in the process of learning and that they can come to you uh, for help when they need it. So I think that's the, the working definition that we're gonna go with today. All right, so now we have this idea of set it and forget it and the set it and forget it mindset is kind of this slippery slope. Um, it's a sneaky trap that you can fall into. It's tempting that you might just set up your course and then you think that it's going to be good to go for the rest of the semester. And 
the reason that we can sometimes fall into this slope is because we, we've done a lot of front loading, if you will. We've done a lot of preparations for our course. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that you don't prep your class ahead of time, um, but in order to be there and to be present for your students, you, you wanna make sure that you are willing to go along and look at for areas where you can tweak them or adjust them for your unique student set. So this idea here is, again, we want uh, faculty to evaluate and adjust. It could be their learning materials or approaches um, continually to ensure that students are progressing towards their learning outcomes. And the only way we can do that is just by looking at our students on, on an individual course basis once it goes live. Great, thank you, Helena. She has dropped the name of a, an article here into the text chat for any of you who are interested. Um, so we do have three different components of the instructor presence in which you can see up here on the screen. And so these include the persona, the social presence, and then your instructional presence. So we'll go through each of these uh, just briefly here. The persona is the instructor personality and teaching style that you infuse into your course. Um, this is what gives your, your students that impression of who you are and it helps them feel more connected to you as their teacher. You can communicate this through throughout your course. It, it's an, again, not just one of those set it and forget it type of things. Um, but some easy ways that you can do this are by including videos of yourself. Uh, if you have an introductory page, you might include a recorded course welcome message um, or even module overviews. And we're going to get into these a little bit more, I promise. Um, we also have the social presence, which in essence is really all about community building. So in other words, what we're saying here is that you can connect with students um, and also it's enables students to feel like they can connect with you. Uh, this is not just a one-sided relationship here. So you want to, again, be the facilitator. You're going to provide opportunities for connections to happen. And it's also important to keep students engaged in your course um, to increase their chances of success. So this does mean being responsive to students through timely communication, um, but also holding them to the same standards. Okay. The instructional presence is um, essentially your role in facilitating students' learning experiences in the course. So you're going to enhance your presence through instruction, and you might want to consider using multimodal learning materials. Um, and so I, I know we already touched on this in the chat. Uh, all of you are very, very on top of these different ideas. What are the different ways that students can interact um, even with their course material? Are there things that they can listen to uh, that are audible? Are, is there text that they can look at? Is there a visual representation? Um, so all of these things can enhance their learning experience. And um, you may even consider providing your students with a weekly video of yourself explaining what they can expect from the course and the assignments and, and how they should go about navigating that week's module or, or lesson or activity. Um, so you can kind of think of it as you're guiding them along. So now we can talk a little bit about creating and sustaining these connections, um, which is our, our first topic. So some examples of ways to create and sustain connections could include developing an introduction discussion forum in which students can get to know um, each other and you. And you wanna make sure that you do read your students' introductions and respond to them. Um, now, I know that this is a, a pretty common scenario, um, but what I, I see a lot is that they'll say, you know, in online courses, go ahead and introduce yourself. And there might, be no follow-up to that. So uh, one of my colleagues has what she likes to call the pet parade and she she specifically asks students to um, introduce themselves and then they should either upload pictures of their pets, their kids, or um, their travels. Uh, and so this really gets people excited. Um, again, they, they've been encouraged to upload uh, photos or videos of, of their recent adventures. 
And then you finally might want to require the peer responses so that students must read about each other and engage in a conversation. So um, just putting a little bit of a, a fun twist on maybe a familiar concept. Another way to create um, and sustain connections in your online course is to hold at least one synchronous session in the first week so that you can interact with your students and, and let them connect with you and each other. Um, within that synchronous session, you can encourage students to share video or audio. We do caution about requiring it due to privacy and equity concerns, but you know you can always encourage it. You could also consider doing an icebreaker activity to make everyone feel more comfortable. Um, and to kind of to build that sense of community. So for example, you could put them into breakout groups and ask them to come up with uh, ways in which they could build a sense of class community and see what and techniques they come up with. So I think in the past, one group came up with creating a group chat on social media so they could talk to each other outside of the classroom environment. Um, so again, it's putting some of that ownership onto your onto your students. Um, this is their class, and and they get to create a part of that atmosphere. So ask them to generate ideas. And last but not least, consider using a welcome assignment or a survey and ask your students how you can best serve them. So you can ask them what are their needs, what are their challenges, what are their goals, um, and how can you help them figure out ways to be successful in light of that context. So uh, this is an area where you have an opportunity to, to learn about them and you might get some you know, unusual insight into your students that you might otherwise not discern if you had not distributed a survey. Ah, we, I see a question here about yellow dig, so that is coming up. So um, I, I will talk to you about that too. Megan, I have a quick question about the survey. Um, are there any resources um, that you know of uh, that will give, I don't know, maybe good survey questions? I've, I've done a survey um, once or twice intending to get a feel for, say, for instance, how students intend to, uh, what they're expecting from the class, how they intend to use that information, uh, meaning how, how is it going to apply to, say, what their future goals may be. So a teacher, senior level class and a junior level class. So if you're interested in graduate school, you know, I'd like to know these kinds of things. Or if you're interested in going into industry. Um, and I find that the kind of answers that I get are, you know, very generic and they don't often give me much uh, to work with in terms of trying to understand how to plan work so that the relevance is felt. Um, I'm wondering if maybe I'm just not using great questions. Um, do you know of a, of a resource or something that some place I could go to for um, to get a better yeah. understanding of what a welcome survey might look like? Yes, let me, um, so after this workshop is over, I am going to send out um, a follow-up email with a list of resources. So I'll go ahead and I'll see if I can link you to some different ideas for um, survey questions. I know that one faculty member, uh, Jason Rohde, has an exemplary course program, and he highlights that he always has um, a survey that he likes to ask his students at the beginning of the semester with some of these questions. So I'll see if I can get a copy of that survey as well for you. OK, thank you. Um, so let me see if I can find that, as well as um, a couple of other resources. So, um, But I can link you. I'll, I'll do some more homework, and I can link the, you to that um, in the follow-up. OK, excellent. Thank you so much. Sure. Alrighty, so um, let's see. All right, I think um, I saw something about yellow dig, so we're going to come up with that one yet, um, or in just a little bit here. But some examples of ways to create and sustain connections include developing an introduction discussion forum, um, which we already just talked about. And we can also um, think about some other opportunities here as well. 
So one way to engage students with the course is to connect your course material to students' interests. So you can use these opportunities you've created to get to know your students and like we said, like that welcome forum. And you're going to leverage that with information into connecting students' interests to your learning materials, maybe to specific activities or um, some type of graded assessment whenever possible or practical, I think would be another way to say that. You can also share your own interests with students so they can get to know you better. I think we talked about being enthusiastic about your field and your course and its material. So you can talk to your students about maybe some of your past experiences, um, accomplishments, projects that you've worked on and show your students uh, what they can expect. Another way to engage your students is to show them how the course materials are relevant to their academic lives. And so this is helping them to think more broadly. It's not just the singular course, it's how does this course fit into my overall academic experience. And so you might discuss what common college expectations do you have um, in your course that students will be expected to follow across their college careers? Um, what are some of the skills and knowledge that will transfer to other college courses? I, I always enjoyed this as an English instructor because I knew that if my course was not required, the majority of my students would not be in my classroom. Um, so I, I always enjoyed playing with this idea that we could still build skills that they could use for courses that they would rather be taking. So um, it's a challenge, but it's always worthwhile to see if you can help them understand why they're here and, and what they can expect to, to draw from your course. And you can also ask how can you build connections between your course and, and another course. So you can ask them specifically to to develop maybe a plan or a map and, and show that strategy. So instead of you just explaining it, you can ask them to, to identify the skills that they're acquiring in your course and where, the, where it will lead to. Um, finally, you, you may also want to emphasize the relevance of your course to your students, uh, future professional lives in order to engage them with learning in your course. So um, you can help your students create those connections and think about how and what they're learning and how it could apply to their future professional goals. Sometimes this can be tricky, um, but again, it's this idea that learning is a broad spectrum and, and it carries over into many um, unexpected places. So we can help to try to highlight that for our students. Um, another way that you can create connections to future professions is by connecting course policies um, to professional expectations. But um, as a note of caution, just be sure that those expectations accurately reflect the workplace and keep in mind that your students are in college, uh, which is a learning environment, not technically a professional one, but they are adult learners. So you, you can still broach that topic with them. Okay, I think I've given you some ideas here up on the screen as well. I, I always hate to read slides to you. Um, I think we can move on. So in addition to creating connections within your course, we do want to talk about communication uh, with students. And you're going to want to communicate with students frequently and in multiple ways in order to maintain presence in your course. So here are some ideas for you. You don't have to do all of them, um, certainly, because it might be overkill. But you could remind students of upcoming deadlines in a weekly announcement and, follow it, uh, and have follow-up announcements. You could create an announcement and send an email when grades are posted and provide any additional instructions you may have, whether that's for accessing, um, accessing a feedback or comments that are in an interactive rubric. You could send reminders about your virtual office hours, uh, including how to make an appointment and how to get to that virtual office space. I do have a little bit more about virtual office hours, so um, that'll come up again. You could post weekly module introductions or overviews and include connections to the previous model. So again, we're, we're talking about a transition here and layering in information, this idea that every new lesson your students learn is building on top of previous knowledge. 
you could post an occasional midweek motivation message or video. Those are always fun, right? It's not just the standard, please don't forget to show up to our synchronous course session. Uh, it could just be a, a random uh, motivational message. And then finally on this one, since I, I talked about all these different types of um, communications that you can send or alerts, just be careful of overkill. If you post too much and too frequently, students may start to glaze over some of your communications. So I, I recommend trying some of these and um, playing with it, making it so not every single Monday of your course, they're going to expect to see an announcement. Um, you know, they're, they're going to become desensitized to it. So, so try to liven it up, uh, give them different ways in which you're connecting with them. In addition to posting announcements, um, if you are using Blackboard Ultra, you now have maybe um, tested out the messaging tool. So um, the messaging tool is an intercourse tool, but it does have a little checkbox where um, anytime you type a message, you can also have it forwarded to their email. So that's a nice way to keep up with your students. And they're more likely to respond, we've noticed, if it goes to their email. So I do always recommend that feature. Another component important component to, uh, for communicating with your students is providing that timely feedback. And so we're thinking about formative and summative assessments. The formative assessments are the smaller pieces, right? These could be your discussion boards, a homework assignment, an in-class quiz. Um, but any of these smaller activities that are leading up to the summative assessments. So for the formative assessments, uh, the students are going to want timely feedback so that they can learn and feel like they've fared for that larger summative assessment. And so I, I tend to think of summative assessments as things like midterms, finals, portfolios, uh, things of that nature. And when it comes time to, for students to look at the summative assignments or assessments, they're going to want to receive feedback for those activities in order for them you know, to be meaningful and useful. They also want to know how their grade was calculated. And so they need your comments and your feedback to be able to learn and improve so that they can move on, you know, to the next unit, the next module, the next assessment, whatever the next milestone may be. Lori wants to know more about weekly motivational messages. Uh, could this be a podcast or a video? Uh, do you know of a good resource I could find good messages to share with my students? Uh, yes, I think I can find some more resources for you. So Lori, I'm keeping a run running list of some of the resources that people are asking for in this workshop. And so I can try to follow up with you. Um, but a nice idea here is that sometimes when you reach out to your students, it's more informal, less scripted. It's not just, hey, this is what we're doing in class this week. Uh, you know, you might just reach out to them and say, hey, I noticed we were having the greatest discussion this week. And I just wanted to say congratulations. You know, you're really on top of things. Um, so those messages can go a long way for your students. So, all right, I'm just making a note here. Weekly motivational messages. Okay, um, returning back to Alicia asked, would the motivational element need to be relevant to coursework or is appropriate to be motivational in the traditional sense? I think you can find a, a nice balance between the two. I, I highly doubt you would be sending motivational messages that don't in some way connect to their course. Um, but again, it's one of those ideas where it's just being authentic with your students and, and connecting with them. Or, you know, maybe you know that everybody's preparing for a large exam and, and they're getting a little tired. You know, maybe they want to hear something upbeat from you and words of encouragement. You know, that's another, another way of looking at it. All righty. So moving forward through this, um, 
with our feedback and again I just like to throw a rule of thumb out there so it'll give you something to work with um, a good rule of thumb is to provide feedback um, no more than one week after the due date um, and, and that seems to be a pretty sufficient amount of time both by student and instructor standards so somewhere in there uh, that's a nice rule of thumb to have Okay, so um, another way that you can maintain presence in your online course is through that frequent communication or um, by recording module overviews or videos that include you on the video um, or at least audio. Again, this idea that they could hear your voice, they know you're a person. Um, and that shows to students that you're communicating with them and it makes it seem more personal. Uh, these videos can help students connect with you and the course and it demonstrates to students that you are personally invested in their learning so it, again it's just a nice touch that um, not everything is a written text I know we're creeping up on 240 here so I'm just kind of breezing along All right, as far as establishing the communication plan goes, another best practice is communicating with students um, to make sure that you respond to their communication in a timely fashion. But this does not mean that you have to be on call 24 seven. So I, I do wanna emphasize that. You can easily say that you will get back to them within 24 to 48 hours. Um, anything that's a reasonable amount of time I think as long as you state that in your syllabus and, and you tell your students about that, usually towards the first week or two of class, uh, that seems to, to help kind of insert your instructor presence. It makes you feel like a, a human. They know who you are. They know how to connect with you. I remember um, as a student, I, I really greatly appreciated when instructors said, I know you're an online student. I know many of you have busy, busy lives and so this is why you chose online education you can email me anytime you want so uh, that's fine just don't expect me to to respond right away if you you email me in the middle of the night uh, but as a student who was waitressing <laughs> and had long evening hours sometimes I was doing my homework in the evening and, and it was really reassuring to hear from an instructor that said hey I understand that you might be doing homework in the off hours, that's fine. If you have questions, you can send me a message, uh, but just so you know, I won't get to it until until the morning. Something to, to that effect. You could consider holding regular virtual office hours as well, um, so that students can meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. So you could use Teams, Collaborate, which is what we're in right now, or Zoom. So NIU has licenses to all three of those products. Um, if you're interested in virtual office hours, you may consider uh, viewing the virtual office hours uh, workshop or recording on our website for details and tips. We have different things like how to set up um, bookings and things of that nature, but I'm gonna try to get to some of those as well. You should also include um, some of your expectations for communication. And these can include what your students can expect from you as well as what you can expect from your students. Um, again, it's this two-way street that you have expectations for them as well. Uh, so if you think it's necessary, you can give them an example email template. Uh, you can include any information you want just so that they can see an example of what you expect at the higher education level. Um, and it's also just a way for them to practice professionalism and, and aid you um, in helping them. All right, so the world is your classroom and I love this photo. Um, online courses happen everywhere, so they are not just isolated to a computer. And I, I love this photo. They're, there's a student out there, um, definitely not just sitting in front of a laptop and inside. So um, don't be afraid to show your students your environment, encourage them to show you theirs if they're comfortable doing so. You can also encourage them to um, take videos out and post them to discussion boards. So 
this is really an exciting idea here. And again, we do have more information specifically on how to do this. We have a mobile app. So sometimes we don't know what technology our students have, but we do know that almost everybody has a cell phone. And so we have a free mobile app for our uh, video platform, Kaltura. So people can literally go anywhere, take their cell phone and, and record a video. So um, it's, a, again, it's this idea that their, their classroom is the world. It, it expands far beyond their computer or their laptop. So if you live in a city, record a video with your city view. Uh, if you're out in the country and you want to include some cornfields, you can do that. You might find that you have students um, all over the country or even outside of the country as well. So um, it's this really nice idea that everybody is sharing and contributing. Wonderful. I will tag everybody on a, a group email then when we're done, since it sounds like there's some different um, resources that people want to share. Um, so I think I'll, I'll do our follow up that way. You can also use discussion forums um, and class conversations. Uh, discussions, this is a un tool unique to um, Blackboard Ultra. It's a great way to help students uh, stay engaged in their course. So um, discussions, or I shouldn't say discussions, um, but class conversations are part of me, unique to Blackboard Ultra. And so this is just a tool that you can enable. You can turn it on or off just with a toggle switch. But this way, if somebody has a question about an assignment, it creates kind of like a side discussion. And anybody can chime in to answer someone's question. So um, that's just a nice informal way for students to, to feel like they can you know, ask some, some additional questions. You can also use Yellow Dig. Yellow Dig is a gamification uh, discussion board. And so we do have a license for them. And it's nice because it gives students an opportunity to decide how they want to interact. In a Blackboard discussion board, the, the typical one that you see is students are required to do a first original post, and then they have to do a follow-up post where they comment on two or three of their peers' uh, posts. Yellow Dig lets students choose how they want to accrue their points. If they post earlier in the week, they might accrue more points because they were getting a jump start on, on their discussion. You can earn points for responding to others. And if somebody does an exceptional post, the instructor can award additional points to, uh, you know, reinforce, you know, this great behavior um, and let them know that they, they've done some outstanding work. So um, again, it, it is kind of a, a fun way to, to take a new look at discussion boards. The class conversations toggle switch in Ultra is if you're um, in an assignment, in an assessment, anything like that, um, you can turn that on when you go to the gear icon. Um, another way that you can encourage students to interact with one another um, and for you to respond to questions about particular learning um, materials, um, activities, or assessments is, again, to enable that class conversation. So <laughs> um, that was actually, I just wanted to show that to you. It was funny that somebody typed that in the chat. Um, I've got the picture right here. And um, the one thing it doesn't show you is the gear icon. But um, if you click on that gear icon, you should see the little um, button. It's like a little toggle switch that says allow class class conversations. And you'll be alerted anytime somebody posts something in the conversations because you'll get a little purple chat bubble. <laughs> I don't know if I'm psychic, but thank you. So, all right, some rules and thumb for uh, participating in discussion boards. And I get a lot of questions about this. Um, nobody is going around and looking at instructors saying you have to respond to every post. Uh, there is no quantification for how many times you need to respond. And in fact, you may, again, want to take a step back so you can facilitate the discussion and put more ownership on, on your students to, to run the, the discussion. So um, again, the idea here is um, 
you might want to chime in with a comment or two every week to show your students that you're engaged, that you're looking, that you're watching. It's not busy work, um, but you're also doing it to model for your students the types of responses that they should be posting. Um, so you're, you're looking for a balance, basically, of your participation in discussion boards, but um, also you don't want to dominate it as well. So don't post too much because students may rely on you to carry the conversation. So um, again, if you have to take a step back and, and you can even just say who would who wants to answer this um, or, or you can ask specific questions of your students. So um, again, look for that balance. Do not feel as an instructor that you are obligated to respond to every student. I have had that question before and you most certainly are not. Another idea here is that you can require office hour meetings. Um, I like this option. I think it's nice because it breaks uh, that ice, that barrier, that initial nervousness that a student may have about um, coming to your virtual office hours. Even if you post information about it, they might not feel comfortable. So one thing you can do is you can require mandatory office hours um, early on in the semester. It could even just be for five minutes, just say, um, here's my, my schedule. I like to use um, bookings for this. If you have an up-to-date um, Office 365 calendar, it works really well. So this is my availability. Um, just pick a, a time slot and come meet me for five minutes. If you uh, mandate that your students come to meet you early on in the semester, they're more likely to approach you if they have questions later on. Um, and again, you can do this more than once. So you might have that initial meeting, which is only just a, a five minute meeting getting to know you. And then you could offer required mandatory um, office hours later in the semester and we can discuss you know, a particular assignment. Um, so again, it's this idea, moving past that set it and forget it mentality um, is, you know, pulling them in for office hours to let them know that, yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm a person. And you really should come talk to me. So I know we talked about this earlier, too, but you can distribute a survey and you can find out what your students already know about a subject that you're teaching. So this is always a fun one. Um, I, I used to do this uh, with my English composition students and I would call it the are you a know-it-all quiz and at the start of the semester I would just ask them a series of, of questions about a topic and they low amount of points really didn't affect their grade but um, you know what you can have five free points as long as you fill out the survey even if you don't know the answer, give it your best guess. Um, you will only lose points if you don't answer it um, or you know, if you say, I don't know. So um, this is kind of a fun one that you can do with your students. And then you can always revisit surveys later on after you've taught a lesson or at the end of the semester. And you can see how their answers have changed over time. You could do surveys at a smaller level um, at a class level, you could have your students come into class and you can say, what do you have a question about with the reading? And um, you can actually ask them a question as they're leaving the classroom. I have one instructor who said, you know, before you can sign out of our synchronous session, you have to type in the chat one thing that you learned today. Um, or, you know, if you don't want to answer one thing you learned, ask me one question, what still needs to be clarified? Um, so again, it's this idea that you keep checking in with your students and, and asking them to, to give you some sort of a response. It, it's going above and beyond, do you have any questions? Because uh, a lot of times they'll just say no or they'll shake their head. Ooh, we're almost done, I promise. And another way that you can go ahead and support student success and to maintain instructor presence is to provide students with some information about campus services and resources. So if you don't already have this, you may consider having a section in your course or in your syllabus uh, dedicated to sharing these resources and to be proactive in pointing students to um, specific things such as, um, you know, if, if you have an essay coming up, you might want to highlight the writing center. Um, 
you might want to remind students about the DRC um, if they need a special accommodations. You can also target resources that are um, maybe needed for specific students. So if somebody mentions to you that they're having a problem with someone on campus, you can link them with the ombud person. Uh, but again, it's just this idea that you have a list of resources and you may uh, continue to expand on that. I know during the pandemic, one instructor had resources for, um, what was it, internet free hotspots. Um, I, I had one instructor who was linking information to uh, food pantries and all sorts of things. So you can also ask your students to contribute to this list of resources because they may know of some additional ones. Um, and I also wanted to point you to Blackboard Assist, which is a relatively new uh, tool. So I don't know if any of you have seen this or not. But now we have a list of these student resources all in one concentrated area. So when you log into Blackboard, instead of going to courses, scroll down and you'll see Assist. And um, going in here, your students will have links to all sorts of different resources on campus or related to NIU. They're all up to date and current, which is nice. So you could even just post um, information about this in your syllabus. So it, it's really just one concentrated area where students can get all of this information um, in one spot. So um, other things that you may want to consider um, as well with your students, I, I think I forgot to mention, is um, you may want to let them know about some other um, additional resources that they have with Blackboard. So um, you can give them the information they need to change their name or their pronouns um, in case that, you know, they're tired of people mispronouncing their names or they want someone to know their pronouns. So you can also provide information like that. Um, so that's a great way just to insert your presence and to let them know that you're, you're seeing them as a, an individual and not just a name on a roster. All right, so I think that was actually my, whew, I made it with five minutes to spare. That was my, my list of, of resources I have for you. And it's all, of, all about your questions. Anything that I can try to answer for you or comments? All right, well, um, floor is yours. So uh, last five minutes, if you have questions or comments, let me know. You can hop on the mic, you can type in the chat. Otherwise, um, you are, I'll give you back five minutes of your day. And I promise I will follow up with some resources for you and um, a link to today's recording. And I'll go ahead and I'll turn off the recording now. <laughs>